Good afternoon and welcome back to Live from the Clinic. I'm Dr Dawn Harper and we've got a really special one today. My dear, dear friend, you might know him from Strictly, from CBeebies, from this morning. Uh, Dr Ranj is also a doctor working in the emergency paediatric department at St Thomas's. And so we've got a very special uh, episode of Live from the Clinic today and I've got my friend Ranj. Ranj, how are you doing? I'm good, thank you. How are you? It's so nice to see you. It's really, really sweet of you because I know you're fantastically busy with all those different hats on. Um, I guess probably, let, can we just start with your proper job, you know, the day job? Um, yes. I mean, I'm sure, certainly for me in general practice, life is very different. Um, How has it changed for you at St Thomas's? So it's really interesting, actually, and I think everybody's experience in the NHS has been different depending on what specialty you work at and where in the country you are. Um, in our department, weirdly, what we've seen is because we work with children, we have seen less patients overall. It's actually got a bit quieter. However, what we are finding is that the patients that are coming in are a lot sicker because obviously they need to be there. Um, and some people have waited at home potentially for a bit too long before coming in and got quite poorly when they do. Um, and also what the other thing that we're doing is we're kind of flexing up, as it were, and helping out our adult colleagues, because on the adult side, it has got very, very busy. They're seeing lots and lots of patients, fortunately, less than they used to as we're coming out of this pandemic. Um, but they are very, very sick and many are still ending up in intensive care. So we're trying to help them out as much as possible. But at the same time, it's still business as normal for us albeit with slightly less people coming in, which is a bit strange. And do you th is that, do you think, because people don't want to bother you or is it they're frightened of actually mm. coming into a hospital setting? Well, it's a mix of different things. So uh, what we know, firstly, I think a lot of parents are um, have got poorly children at home and they think it's coronavirus. And the advice has been, if you've got coronavirus, stay at home. And that's quite right, actually. Most children that get coronavirus only get a mild illness and they don't really actually need to seek medical advice and they get over it by themselves. Um, however, there will be a number, number that will be mistakenly labelled as coronavirus. And, you know, people may be sitting at home thinking they're doing the right thing when actually they should potentially be picking up a phone or taking the child to see someone. There's definitely a group of people who are worried about going into a healthcare setting because they think that you might put themselves or their family at risk when actually we know that you and I both know that the measures of infection control and hygiene that we've ramped up to try and protect our patients as much as possible mean actually you're probably at low risk going to your GP than you are to the supermarket yeah. right now. Yeah. Um, and finally, many people don't realize that the NHS is still seeing patients. We're still open 24 seven. You know, for anything you may need to see your doctor for, we're still there for emergencies and it's not all coronavirus. So please come and see us. Yeah, actually, you know, I, I could probably give a very similar story. We're, we're really quite worried in general practice that we're not seeing, you know, all the potential cancers and so on. And so really important that people do know. Yeah. In, um, in the Evelina where you work, have you done this sort of red and green zone thing? Yes, so we've been very, in, in Ainey where we work, we have basically divided the department up and um, we have a whole area in Ainey which is purely for suspected coronavirus um, and everybody's in full gowns, visors, you know, really, really strict measures in there. And then we have other areas which are lower risk where we see everybody else basically. So that's a really useful and helpful way of just keeping people who don't need to be mixing and potentially being put at risk separate. And that's why it's really important that people aren't worried that when they come in, they aren't worried about picking something up because we have all of those really strict measures in place. And so do you have staff, if you go in and do a particular shift that you'll be doing in the coronavirus department or another shift that you'd be working elsewhere? Yeah, and actually for, um, for the coronavirus areas, we aren't allowed to walk through them quite obviously. Um, we have to be really, really careful about who's allowed to enter and who's allowed to leave, making sure that they're fully uh, protected as much as they can be. Um, yeah, we are really, really hot on that at the moment, which is good. Um, eventually, as I think we start to come out of the, where we are coming out the other side of the peak now, as things start to settle down, we'll start to relax things a little bit more and go back to normal ways of working. But nobody knows how long that's going to take at the moment. And 
as we know, there's always that small concern that we might have a second surge. So as we release lockdown and things get relaxed a little bit and we go back to our day-to-day -day lives, we may actually see a slight spike in cases, albeit it may not be as bad as the first, and we have to be prepared for that. So I think people need to be prepared for certain measures being reintroduced or the way we work is probably going to be different for quite some time. So better get used to it, I suppose. I, mean, I, I wonder actually whether the way we work might in some ways change for good. I mean, the number of telephone and video consultations that we're having in general practice, mm. um, and I think we're realising, initially I felt a bit exposed because you can tell so much by actually being with somebody, can't you? All those non-verbal mm. cues that you get and mm. when you're dealing with things just by telephone. Um, we've had to kind of just rethink, do I really need to ask this person to come into the surgery? And I suspect it might change the way we practice, certainly in general practice. I mean, I guess it's, it's, more, it's different in an emergency department by definition, mm. you know, you're dealing with Yay. sicker people. I think you're absolutely right. There are certainly going to be, if we can say that there are any positives out of this, there are certainly going to be things that we all take forward, I think. Um, different ways of working, not having to see people face to face where we were all slightly nervous about that, but we know it can work. I mean, we've expanded our intensive care capacity by 300%. Wow. When you know you have to, you can do it. It just goes to show when, you know, when things are really, really pressurised and and you need to step up, we can do that. And there are other, I think, non-healthcare benefits directly that are going to come out of this. Um, we have found ways of connecting with each other, connecting with loved ones, people that might be lonely and isolated, and doing that as just an everyday thing, which I think is hugely important. Um, we are finding out that we can work from home more and therefore it's better for the environment. We don't have to travel quite so much and we don't have to use our transport quite as much. Um, we can spend more time with our families at home and do things together. You know, that meal time together around the table has come back. Yeah, and, and that we've been saying for so long, <laughs> let's hope it stays mm. because there are some real positives that could come out of this. I just hope that we can continue some of this. I'm, yeah, I'm completely with you. So, Ranch, you and I are pals through media and television. Gosh, I've yeah. never asked For years. you a long time. <laughs> yes, a long time. And you're way overdue a visit down to the Cotswolds. So, as soon Absolutely. as we're allowed, I can't we'll get wait. You back down. <laughs> um, but I, do you know what? I've never asked you. How did you get into media? By accident. <laughs> really. So, um, I, I mean, I followed a long time after you. I, I was watching you for years and in awe of you, obviously, um, on TV and everything that you did. And I was super, super impressed. And um, it was never really something I thought that I would do. I didn't come out of university thinking I want to be in television. Um, it kind of happened by accident. I'd been working in hospital, in paediatrics for a good four or five years. Um, I was working full time. It was quite, it was quite full on, mm. let's say. And I've always had a creative streak and I needed a creative outlet. Um, and this opportunity came up to work with the BBC, just advising them on some of the young people's programme. And I thought, well, this looks quite interesting. It's something different. It's a bit of a break um, from the normal day-to-day -day stuff that I do. And it borrows from my expertise. So I'll give it a go. Um, and that's kind of where it started, that I was working behind the scenes, first of all. Then they asked if I wanted to be in front of the camera. And I said all right, I'll give it a go, see what happens. And that's kind of been my motto throughout my career, weirdly, with television. I'll give it a go and see what happens. Um, and yeah, it's just kind of over time, one thing led to another from my name got passed around. I got involved in other TV shows. And then um, I ended up coming up with the concept for CBB's Get Well Soon, which is my children's TV show. And then after that was made, um, things I think really kind of took off and I and I started working on bigger and bigger shows and I met yourself and various other people that are working in our field mm. um, made some great friends along the way have had some amazing times done some inc been lucky to do some incredible shows um, and it's now become a second career weirdly mm. um, so I've kind of I've always continued my NHS work um, I just went from full-time to part-time and I've kind of varied that as I've gone along. I've stepped it up, obviously, during pandemic times because TV stuff and media has quietened down and that's allowed me to up the number of shifts that I do. Um, and that's really hugely important to me because my NHS work always has taken priority and I, I, I sort of balance everything else around it. Um, but I've, 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 yeah, I've now got these two jobs, which I love and adore. And 
um, I'm constantly juggling, but I really, really enjoy it. Yeah, but you're probably a bit like me in that I think that they actually complement each other really well. Yes. You know, working yeah. at the front line, you know, being a proper doctor tells you what yeah. real people worry about. Um, and then we're very privileged, aren't we, working in the media because we kind of get the heads up. Um, you know, now yes. we're speaking yeah. to the Deputy Chief Medical Officer twice a week on our little conference calls Gosh. and so on, which Gosh. is quite a privilege, really, you know, um, and I know my practice find that feedback quite useful that we, you know, so mm. we're very lucky. I, um, I only recently realised that you actually wrote CBB's Get Well Soon. <laughs> yeah, so um, with Get Well Soon, when it first came about, which was almost eight, maybe nine years ago now, actually, um, I kind of came up with the concept. I helped create it and uh, develop it and write it and I checked it and then I presented it and I sang the songs, etc. So I was very, very much involved in that. But we had writers doing, predominantly doing the bulk of the writing. We would have meetings where we come up with ideas, they go away, come back with a script. And the very recent um, episode, we've just done a short for the CBB's Get Well Soon on iPlayer, a five minute episode explaining coronavirus mm -hmm. to um, preschoolers predominantly. And that, I kind of came up with the idea for that one just early on during this whole coronavirus thing that we're going through and said to the BBC and the production company, look, we really should do something. And I nagged and nagged and nagged and nagged and eventually they relented. Um, and uh, I, literally that day that they said, yeah, sure, we're, we're looking to do this. I rustled up a script in an hour. <laughs> sent it over <laughs> and, I, and that was the very first time I've ever written a proper script for anything on TV and um yeah it's it came out uh last week and it shot straight up to the top of the iPlayer charts Excellent. which I'm hugely proud of but there's a little bit of me that says I told you so <laughs> <laughs> because not everybody knows what a fabulous singing voice you've you've got i remember last oh, time but that's kind of how we know each other isn't it i've well, sung down in you down sang in, uh, in the my kitchen and... table you sang stevie wonder numbers <laughs> after one or two glasses i think but it was a really yes. lovely lovely time and you sing in a choir i do yeah. with the lovely uh, alex ellison who i think has performed at the barn yes before. he's marvelous um he's a a fabulous friend, a fabulously talented musician. I sing in the Adam Street Singers, um, who you've come to see, yeah. which you've been so lovely about supporting. Um, and it's I do not hard. It's, it's not a hardship, Ranch. <laughs> coming to listen to you guys sing. In fact, we're going to get you down but here. You came to listen know. at the Royal Albert Hall as well yes. that one time, didn't you? Yes. Uh, a yes. couple of times With, you've been to, um, to see me there. Yeah. Uh, there yeah, aren't many been, doctors who can say they've sung on the stage at the Royal Albert Hall, Ranch. My gosh, when when I got the opportunity, there was no way I was going to turn that down. But I love I love singing. I've been trying to do more of it in lockdown, actually, because now I'm at home more. Um, and singing, I find as a stress reliever is really good. It makes you feel fantastic, even if you're not a professional singer or an opera singer. Singing itself, the process of it is so uplifting, empowering and does wonders for your mental health. So um, I'm hoping to do a bit more singing after this is after we come out of this, because I feel like I haven't done it for a while. Well, you know, last week I interviewed on the show on Life from the Clinic and um, I interviewed our local respiratory uh, consultant and she told about a lovely chap who through his CPAP mask, you know, those tightly fitted yes. masks, was singing to try and strengthen his lungs. And once he got off CPAP, Fantastic. he was getting the really whole good. ward to sing. And she said it was pure therapy. Yeah. Yeah. It's brilliant. Music therapy itself, I think, is fantastic. Music, singing, dance therapy. But there's actually some science behind it. They've uh, There have been actually some studies that look at cystic fibrosis children and singing as a way of chest physio. Yeah. Because it actually helps bring some of those secretions and things that they suffer with up. Um, there's a lot more to be said for singing than I think people think. Well, if anybody gets the chance to come and listen to you guys and the Adam Street Singers, they certainly <laughs> should. So, look, I couldn't possibly have you on the show without asking you about your Strictly experience. Tell me, because you got the call quite late, I think, didn't you? I did. Yeah. Yes. So, go on, tell uh, us about it. Back in 2018, I did it. So, it feels like a lifetime ago now. And it was, um, I think I got the call in late July. And by that time, I'd kind of given up hope because they start doing things in August. And I'd already lined up a job in hospital to start um, uh, sort of at the end of August, beginning of September. And I thought, well, it's not going to happen. I remember sitting on the train up to Liverpool uh, and so my agent rang up. You'd had and a conversation up. with them then earlier and then thought it had gone away. Yeah. Okay. I'd, I'd had a couple of conversations. I'd even had an audition and 
uh, it just didn't seem to go anywhere. And I thought, well, this isn't going to happen. It was li- I was a little bit heartbroken because Strictly is a show that both of us adore. Absolutely. Um, and it was the absolute dream for me to do something like that. And when I got the call from my agent and he said, I'm really sorry. And I was like, oh, Craig, do you know what? I prepared myself. It's fine. Don't worry. And his next words were, you're going to have to put your dancing shoes on. I screamed in the middle of this train. <laughs> I had to run in the toilet and scream. Um, and then it was just a whirlwind. I just You just get swept up in this whirlwind of glitter and music and dance. And I had the best time. It was so hard, so, so hard, physically and mentally, so draining. But I got so much out of it. I love dance now. So how did you keep it? Because you had to keep it a secret. I did. You didn't have, I did. did. Fortunately, I only had to keep it a secret for three weeks, I think it was, because I was one of the latter additions to the series. Okay. Um, and uh, luckily, I didn't have to keep it secret for very long. But before my involvement was announced, somehow, I don't know how, it got leaked to the press. So it kind of took away a spoiled a bit of that surprise a little bit. Because um, the press are always kind of guessing and thinking oh this person or that person and postulating and things like that but um it got leaked so it kind of took a little bit of the surprise out but when it really went out I couldn't quite believe it it was just and that's when it all just kind of whoosh off it goes um you know you're, you're in for a medical and then you're in for doing promotional like uh photography and shoots and you're trying on outfits and then you start rehearsing and then before you know it you're on that stage that live stage on the dance floor on a Saturday night in front of 10 million people doing your first dance and you're just thinking, oh my gosh, how am I, what is going on? How am I gonna do this? And I just had, um, the only way, the only reason I got through it is because I had the best partner. I really did, she was incredible. Oh, bless you. I mean, you you and I are used to doing live telly, but you know, the nerves, did you, were you absolutely terrified? I got really bad anxiety, Dawn. I've never had anxiety, I suppose, to a noticeable degree in my life. But during Strictly was when my anxiety just hit the roof. And um, I had to work out ways of how to deal with it and how I was going to keep myself calm. And Jeanette, my partner, really, really helped uh, in, in managing some of that because it is it is really stressful. You're, you're doing so much in such a short space of time and it all comes to a head at the end of the week that your anxiety does go through the roof. And if I got to do that all again, I'd probably do it slightly differently. The, the other thing was that I was still doing my hospital shifts. So, you know, it wasn't unusual for me to do a few hours of dance rehearsal, go and do a night shift and then do eight hours of dance rehearsal afterwards. <laughs> but um, I had to do that. So that was fine. If I, if I had to do if I, not that it's ever going to happen like that again, but if I got to do Strictly again, I would try and put everything else away yeah. and just concentrate on the dancing because it, it, I mean, you, you need all the hours you can get. And you seem to, because um, of course we see you on the, on the show on the Saturday night um, and on the results show, but how much time, because you seem to have a real kind of camaraderie with the other celebrities uh, on the show. So how much time do you get to spend with them and how much are you just locked in a gym somewhere (laughs) with Jeanette? Well most of the week you're locked in a gym and you're rehearsing and you don't really get to see any of the other contestants and then you meet at the weekend and because you're all in the same boat you're all in this pressure cooker or be in various different places when you come together you really do bond really quickly um and you become really, really close. And I'm still really close to lots of them. We're texting all the time. Faye Tozer just messaged me this morning oh, yeah. asking about my light, ironically. Which <laughs> <laughs> the one that um, I want. <laughs> the ring light that I use for helping. <laughs> so we're still, you, you, you become really, really close really quickly, especially to your partner, because um, you share so much and such an intense environment. You're in it together and you're at your most vulnerable and you rely on your partner so much and they support and help you so much. It's inevitable that you become really close to these people and it's heartbreaking when you leave because you kind of feel like you're leaving all your mates I I likened it to someone that said it that um it's like you're on a party bus you're having an amazing time then you get dropped off and then your friends carry on and the bus pulls away and yeah that was yeah I get that was what I was going to say to you because I mean I and an awful lot of other people think you went far too early um you were just great Ranch loved it but how do you that must be a real kind of 
uh, come down. You've so, you know, you go from this high octane, how many other hours mm. a day that you're training, and then there's nothing. How do you cope with that? I've I've never experienced anything like it, Dawn, and I haven't really spoken about it very much. The two weeks after I exited, and it was a big surprise when we left because. I loved that our last dance was a samba. It's one of my favorite dances, one of my favorite songs to George Michael's Freedom 90. It was a really wonderful week. And it was a comeback from the week before because I hadn't had a great week the week before. Um, and to me, I felt ready. I was fighting. I was ready to go again. And then when we left, we were heartbroken. Both of us were heartbroken. So was I. I was coming, and, um, I was coming into the show the following week. Do you remember? Yes, I know. I, I was completely devastated. Thing. And then... For two weeks, I literally spiraled. And this is what happens. You go from 100 miles an hour to zero miles an hour overnight. And I spiraled and spiraled almost out of control. I needed to feel that rush, that sort of, and my body was craving physical activity. It was, it was, it was craving that intensity, but all of a sudden it had gone. Um, and I just, I just remember being in a really dark place afterwards, actually, for a couple of weeks, because I... I, readjusting to normal life was really, really hard. And it's no surprise that people go a bit off the rails, actually, when they finish something like that, because you develop a little bit of a Stockholm syndrome in a weird way. This, which, that's what um, I think people in the military get, don't they? they or, or, or anyone that's been cooped up yes. in, in something for a long time. And then, yeah, you become institutionalized. And then when you go, you can't really cope with the real world. Um, yes, yeah, so it was a very tough two weeks afterwards. And then I gradually got myself back together again. And one of the things that got me back was dancing again. I started dancing and I did it for fun and I do it for exercise. And soon as that happened, I thought, right, OK, now my body has got so used to this and wanted this. It's kind of like a bit of a drug. <laughs> I was kind of, you know, feeding that urge again and really kind of finding myself a bit more and just getting myself back on my feet. And I still dance to this Do day. Do you? Okay, so what's yes, the dance you doing? So I discovered that I love Latin dancing. I never, ever thought I would say this. I'm not really built for ballroom because ballroom suits very tall people who are very long and slender and can hold their arms up, which I can't do. I'm a mover <laughs> and I don't like to do things in hold. I like to do things by myself. So Latin dancing was perfect for me. So I do... Um, Zumba now, which is um, an exercise class based on Latin rhythms, which is amazing. I mean, it's so good. It gets you so fit and you feel fantastic. Um, I do a class called Latin Burn. Um, I'm trying out various different styles just as exercise classes. Uh, and then, you know, I, I carry, after the show, I did the tour and I did a couple of Strictly Cruises. So I kind of carried on doing those sorts of things. Um, and I love it. I just love it. I want to do the Christmas special now. That's what I would love to do. Oh, okay. Uh, is dance the Christmas special. That would be amazing. I remember um, at, well, you always come to the St. John Ambulance um, Awards dinner each year. Yeah. And I remember sitting next to Fabrice Mwamba one year. Yes. And he yeah. just did the Christmas special. He hasn't done the, the whole Strictly thing. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I remember, it'd be interesting to hear what your, your thoughts are on this. He said to me, I just jumped at it. He said, I thought it'd be really great to be able to learn to dance. Um, yeah. But he said, I could dance that routine with my partner, but I still can't dance with my wife. Did you feel a bit like yeah. that? But this is it. Because you learn every week on a Monday, you get a brand new song, a brand new routine and a brand new style of dance. And you almost have to forget what's just happened the week before. And you only have four days to learn it. You have Monday to Thursday to learn this. Um, so you, and you, you don't learn the style. You don't learn the style of dancing. You don't go through that discipline that you normally would do to learn Latin dancing. And the, you know, the technique of the cha-cha or, or the, the timing of the salsa, you don't really learn it. You just learn your routine. So even though you might be amazing at your routine, it doesn't mean that you can dance. It just means that you can do your routine. And it took me a while afterwards to kind of come back and think, right, why do you do this move? What what exactly does it mean? Like Jeanette used to describe there's a there's a there's a hip action that happens in Latin dancing, particularly in things like cha cha and samba. They where you you weirdly it's so not what you how you normally do things. You flick your back hip out 
and use your back leg to propel you forward. It's really strange. And she used to call it flicking the skirt because that's what you're doing. I could never flick the skirt until I finished <laughs> Strictly. That's when I understood what she meant. Now I can flick the skirt. <laughs> so um, do you literally, you get given the, the song and the routine on a Monday. Do you have any say in the music choice or costume no. choice? Or well, that? you kind of, you kind of vaguely throw your like, preferences in and say oh I'd love to do this or I'd love to do that and your partner's always listening but um you don't really get a say in the song choice you don't really get a say in what dance you do you find out on the Monday and you just have those four days and bearing in mind you're doing everything else in those four days as well um you have those four days to learn your routine because on Friday you're in the studio and you're blocking it through and you're doing it in preparation for the and you're doing dresses and everything and on Saturday it's show day Sunday is the only day you get off which basically means you do laundry <laughs> and, all your other life, and all your other life chores and, and jobs that you're supposed to be doing. Um, and then Monday, you're back in Monday morning. It's honestly, it's a, tr it's a rapidly moving travel agent. You kind of feel like this isn't stopping. This isn't stopping. I've just got to keep going. Wow. So listen, you're incredibly busy um, and you've got a new podcast amongst, amongst all the other things that you do. Yeah, so one of the things that's come out of lockdown is I've started to dip my toes into various other things. A lot of the stuff I've done to try and help, um, I suppose, inform and educate the public as we all like, as, as we always have done. So I've done a lot of stuff on social media around educating people around what's happening around coronavirus and some of the advice that's out there. And then we've started this podcast, four of us, um, Dr. Zoe, who you know, Dr. Sarah and Dr. TJ, we're all um, doctors who work in healthcare, but do a little bit of telly as well. We sort of came together and thought, well, we, we, you know, we catch up every now and again, we have some drinks and we'll chat medical stuff and have fun. Why don't we just turn that into a podcast? And we did. And we're five, we've just done the sixth episode we are top of the UK medical podcast chart. We've just broken and hit the Americans, oh, wow. uh, the American chart. So we're top of the UK medical one. Um, and it's going from strength to strength. And we're just having fun doing it. We're doing it off our own backs at the moment, recording it from our own flats and houses, socially distancing over the internet. So that's taught us a lot, working it out as we go along. But once lockdown is over, hopefully we'll be able to take it even further when we can actually see each other and try and get some guests in dawn you have to come in as a guest when we start getting guests in that would be I'll, amazing I'll return have. the favor <laughs> it's called steph's drugs and rock and roll steph's <laughs> drugs and rock and roll steph's I'll, drugs and rock and roll it's I'll on apple it. and spotify and everything but Excellent. steph's because we're doctors drugs because it's medication not the other kind of yeah drugs. um and rock and roll because it's a bit of fun everyone likes a bit of rock and roll fantastic you're not going to go and live in the states are you range no, no, no one's offered yet. I mean, who knows? Someone might sweep me off my feet and say, come live with me in my mansion in LA. <laughs> and I'll come and be your housekeeper. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know, Rand, you're so sweet because I know you're incredibly busy and to give us some time. People are loving listening to you. Love oh, Dr. Rand and he's hot, I've got here. Oh, wow. <laughs> it's really warm in my flat at the moment. <laughs> So listen, honestly, lots of hi, Dr. Ranj, love Dr. Ranj. You know, people are loving you. So thanks ever so Thank much. You. I really, really appreciate it. I'll definitely return the favour when we're out of yes. lockdown. Um, and listen, just stay Absolutely. safe. And um, You too. As soon as you can get down here, you've got to come to this theatre. They've got fantastic... Let's do a gig at the barn. I want to do a gig at the barn. Will you bring the Adam Street singers down and do oh, a gig at the barn? Absolutely. We'd love to. Okay. We're always up for doing I've got witnesses like in here. Okay? They're all <laughs> always up for it. You know how much we love a sing song. <laughs> yeah, fantastic. You know how much we love a party. Fantastic. We'll see you down here as soon as we can. And thank you ever so much. Oh, thank you. Bye-bye. Well, what a lovely episode of Life from the Clinic. He's a dear, dear boy and a very busy man, so I really do appreciate his time. Next week, I shall be back with Dr. Lee David, who is a GP and psychologist who's going to be telling us about her 10-minute CBT training and a new initiative on mental health in adolescence. But until then, stay indoors and stay safe.
In March 2018, we opened our doors to the public with a vision not just to create challenging professional theatre, but to use this as a platform to inspire and bring communities together. Theatre and culture build identity. With theatre and culture in our local life, the community landscape is more vibrant. Local life is enriched. We believe that the benefits of theatre should be available for everyone. Our Theatre for All programme has removed financial barriers, giving disadvantaged people access to the theatre free of charge. So we were told that we'd come here and have a Christmas meal and then go and watch A Christmas Carol. Our aim is to make live professional theatre available to everyone and use that experience for positive change. Theatre can be transformational in young lives. Our academy is now in its fourth year and we continue to build on our vision of bringing the best performing arts tuition to the heart of the Cotswolds. We work hard to make our academy as inclusive and as accessible as possible. Discounts apply for parents with more than one child. Our bursaries help support talented children from less affluent backgrounds. The Academy creates a fun and challenging environment where children can build friendships and develop key skills not just for theatre, but for life. We are also able to provide real opportunities for students who wish to pursue careers in the arts. My name is Harry Apps. I am currently playing Marius in Les Miserables in the West End. Barn outreach and learning programmes engage with thousands of people. Our free workshops support the drama curriculum in local schools. Singing and musical theatre workshops in community groups and care homes have helped address issues of isolation. Our Song for Sirencester project in aid of mental health charities brought our community together in an unprecedented way. We've collaborated with many charities in the region, including the Churn Project, to support individuals dealing with the barriers to finding work. Since working you and my life's changed. It's given me some purpose, given me an interest, some confidence I was lacking prior to all this. The Barn Theatre played a pivotal role in the town's 2018 World War I centenary celebrations. Who could forget our record-breaking human poppy? Our live streaming work on the annual Advent Festival helped thousands engage and take part in Sirencester's Christmas festivities. In these times of uncertainty, we strive to keep the community together. The theatre may be temporarily closed, but our commitment to you goes on. Even now, our amazing costume department are helping the NHS by making scrubs for frontline workers. We've used our technology to build a free live streaming service that provides much needed community news and entertainment for all the family. Broadcasting every day to keep us all connected. We are not just a theatre. We are the bar.